Good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day. We're so glad you're joining with us today in worship. Let's all stand today as we prepare to join our voices and our hearts in worship today. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 23 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonderful works among all peoples. For the Lord is great and highly praised. He is feared above all gods. from Hebrews 2, 5 through 12. For he was not subjected to angels, the world to come that we are talking about, but one has somewhere testified, what is man that you remember him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject, subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him, but we do see Jesus, made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering and death. For in bringing many sons to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, all things exist for him and through him, should make the source of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Amen. Would you make your way back to your seats and sing this with us? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and 
and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand
Father in heaven, we come to you and we pray that we would recognize the beauty of the depths of the mercy that is available uh, in you and you alone. And Father, we pray that we would realize our responsibility and our righteousness that's found in all of those thoughts. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The guy kept repeating, don't forget to breathe. Don't forget to to breathe. That's not a common instruction that we find, is it? That someone tells you constantly, don't forget to breathe. But let me tell you the context. A couple of years ago, I went with some friends and my children to Hopkinsville to explore what it was like to scuba dive. And we were going on a discovery dive. And so they put you in this wetsuit type thing and they put the, uh, uh, the tanks on your back and the mask on your face and they explain to you everything that's there. And they go through about 10 or 20 instructions, and about five times in 20 instructions, they say this, don't forget to breathe. And, and I wanted to say at the end of that, I go, you know, the guy's really getting his point across that he keeps saying, don't forget to breathe. And it's kind of crazy to tell a human to stop forgetting to breathe because that's just something that comes natural to us. But you know what's amazing? Is, is we get out to where we're diving down about 20 feet, and we're going to spend about 30 minutes underneath the water and, and instantaneously, as soon as I got underneath the water, you know what happened? I forgot to breathe. I forgot to breathe. You're, you're under the water, and, and you, don't, you don't think that sucking in air is something that you should be doing, and, and I forgot to breathe. Think about these last words that are given to us in particular situations that make a lot of sense and seem like it should be really, really natural, but sometimes living them out are incredibly difficult. The Lord Jesus, at the end of each gospel, in the beginning of the book of Acts, 
declared some last words to his disciples. He talked to them about what we affectionately call the Great Commission, that he was calling them out to go and tell the good news everywhere. See, Easter has happened, the resurrection has happened, the, the cross has happened, the crucifixion has happened, and, and now we are marching towards the, the establishment of the, the church at Pentecost, and the disciples are doing their work, and they're learning a little bit more about Jesus each and every day, and he is challenging them about what's going to take place when he is gone, and he says some very power-packed words that are even more important to the church than don't forget to breathe. I invite you to open up the scriptures to Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8, and we have been marching through the first chapter of the book of Acts as we've followed up Easter and everything that it had to say to us. And this morning, I want you to think about this thought, just two simple words, you will, you will. And what that means for us from the mouth of Jesus as he was giving us incredibly important last words to think about as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Acts 1-8, a very simple verse of scripture that we will spend our time in this morning. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Just before this, the disciples asked the question. They said, Jesus, is this now when you are going to restore your kingdom right here? Is this when Israel is going to be elevated and we are going to take over this place? And what their understanding of Jesus, was he a political leader that had just risen from the dead? And now the armies of Israel are going to be triumphant over against the entire world and the Lord will finally reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, as they believe is prophesied in the scriptures. And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the seasons or the times. And the end of verse number 6 and 7. And he says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You are going to have the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean to the church what does that mean to us today, gathered as the church? I'm going to make three simple statements today and, and then give you some things that, that uh, you should do, um, some ways in which you can apply this as an individual and as a church. And, and I would say this, these instructions are as vitally important to the spiritual life of any believer as oxygen is to the physical life of any human. This is what we are called to do as believers. I, I read a little story some time ago about a little boy that had made a model sailboat. He, he had meticulously glued it together. He had meticulously painted it. Everything was in beautiful shape. When he was finished with it, he encased it in glass and never saw if it would float, never got it out and played with it. His little brother wanted to, wanted to pick it up and play with it, but he, he, he never let him do it. The, the, the model boat was continually pristine and beautiful behind the glass and protected from anyone that wanted to do anything to it. Along the same time he was building his model, his parents bought a boat. They bought a boat that they would take out to, uh, uh, to, to the lake on the weekends, and, and they would spend some great thing, some great times in there. And, 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 and you know, uh, um, one, of our, one of our men told me, they said, you know, the word boat is an acronym. Have you ever heard this? The word boat's an, an acronym? It's, it's an acronym for bust out another thousand, right? <laughs> and, and, and so it, he did exactly what his family began to do, what most people do with a boat. They, uh, they, they love it, they love it, they like it, they like it, and then they leave it, they leave it. And this is what began to happen to it, is, is it was in the ocean, and it, it began to um, uh, have barnacles that would be on the bottom, these um, things that would weigh the boat down and, and would actually attack the integrity of, of the boat. And somebody made a really interesting observation. They said, you know, the boat that's actually in the water, it only goes bad when you don't use it all the things are attracted to it when it sits dormant 
in the water. And the boat behind the glass that stays pristine is not good for anything. So church, let me tell you today, let's think about this in the gospel work that we are called to. Who do we want to be? Who do we want to be? Do we want to be the boat that sits and does nothing? Do we want to be the boat that sits in the water and is absolutely useless and, and then will be infected by everything around it? Or do we realize that the church is called to be active and living with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so what did Jesus tell the church about how this takes place in their life? All right, three statements. Number one, you will be competent and confident for gospel work by the Holy Spirit. The initial phrase that comes up in this particular verse of Scripture says this, you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you or the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Think about the phrase for just a minute. You will receive power. If you take the thrust of the word from the Greek New Testament, it actually would say, it's not good English, but it's a good understanding. It's you must receive power. You must receive power to tell us that the task is so vital, is so incredibly large, is so complex that without the power source of the Holy Spirit given to the church, you won't accomplish this. But the certainty of what Jesus had promised in the person of the Holy Spirit is there, alive, and ready for the church. And so there is a statement that comes in this first phrase to tell us this. You will be competent, and you will be confident for gospel work through the Holy Spirit. Telling them this. The task seems large, yes. The gospel is hard, yes. Individuals will suffer persecution, yes. They will suffer because of the gospel's sake. But you will be confident and you will be competent, not because of your own abilities, but because of the Holy Spirit who is empowering you and because he is comforting you, because he resides inside of you, because he lives in you. You can accomplish the task of telling the world the good news about Jesus. That's that's good word, isn't it? Is, isn't that encouraging words from the Word of God that says, because of the Holy Spirit, not because of your own pedigree, not because of your own intellect, not because of your abilities, not because of your good looks, the gospel will go forward and it will be powerful and you can be confident to share the good news of the gospel. Some time ago, I was ready to purchase an iPad, and I go in places like Best Buy, and I see about three or four options that are there, and uh, I'm going to probably mess up some of this terminology, all the, all the gigs, all the megabytes, all the processors, the screen, all the ratios on the screen, uh, uh, all the wireless capabilities. It all just begins to be a little bit of mumbo jumbo in my mind. And, and, and here's the deal. Um, salesmen are not really, hap- they're not really helpful at this, at this point because I don't speak the language. They go, well, you know what, how large are you looking? And, of course, when I, he said, how large are you looking, I go, oh, about this big right here. <laughs> and he says, no, how, how, much, how, how, how much memory do you want? And, and so we had this conversation, and uh, I looked at the cell flyer and saw how much they were. And so you know what I did? Uh, I called Aaron. That's what I did. I go, hey, I need you to do something with me. And uh, he came from his office. We got in the car. I told him, hey, we're going to Best Buy. I need to buy an iPad. I need you to tell me which one to buy. Now, I walked in a whole lot more confidently the second time than I did the first time. Why? Because I had somebody that spoke the language. Now, think about this from the gospel standpoint. You speak the language. You're empowered. You have everything that any believer has ever had. In the history of the world, you have the Holy Spirit of God. You are competent to share the good news. And you can be confident that the Lord will use your effort. Someone said that Americans are afraid of one phrase 
more than any other. And it is the phrase of admitting that you don't know. To have to say the phrase, I don't know. That's intimidating in so many different situations, isn't it? To, to, to feel less than because of a lack of knowledge. Well, Jesus said, you will be competent. And you can be confident. Because you will be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God himself. That we look into our corner and we realize, we realize that the one who sits with us is the Holy Spirit of God. And he empowers us. Number two. The next phrase is this. You will be my witnesses. Think about this phrase. You will be a vocal and specific gospel witness. You will be a vocal and specific gospel witness. Let's take, in, let's, let's, let's take this apart just a little bit. A couple of phrases again. This is imperative. Jesus did not say you can be. He did not say you should be. He said you will be. And taken, you must be. You must be my witnesses. That word witness there is the word martyreo. It is talking about those who are even willing to give with their life a gospel witness. That they are willing to lay it on the line completely and totally, to tell others about the good news of the gospel. Notice what Jesus said about what you'll be a witness of. You will be a witness of him. We are to be vocal, and we are to be a specific gospel witness. Think about this for just a moment. There is a, uh, there, there's a, a, a quote that's attributed to a couple of different guys that says this. It says, share the gospel everywhere, and if necessary, use words. That's pretty clever, isn't it? That's pretty clever. But pretty crazy as well. I, I, I get it. I get it. Our example should declare the gospel. That our actions should declare that Jesus Christ has made a radical difference in our lives. It should. But... Sometimes it absolutely requires you opening your mouth and speaking about it. As a matter of fact, I would say much more than sometimes it requires that. It requires it every time you have opportunity to be vocal about the hope that lies within you. That's what Peter said. He says, don't miss an opportunity to give an account. Always be prepared. Always be ready to tell about the hope that lies within you, that you are vocal about your gospel witness. The second part of it is this, is that you are my witness. Well, who are we referring to at that particular point? Who does that pronoun refer to? It refers to Jesus. And that what the church should witness to is the saving power that comes through the person of Jesus Christ alone and nothing else. That, that's it, completely and totally. We are confident and we are specific about our gospel witness. There are many things that we can be engaging in on a regular basis that, that, that help individuals out, but are devoid of a gospel message of Jesus Christ. We do a food ministry in our church, and, and we have some individuals who will be down there tomorrow. And they'll have about 150 families come by. In two days at the care center, they are meeting a need, and when opportunity presents itself, they are telling them why they're meeting the need, because Jesus Christ has changed their life. There is an erroneous push in our culture to, to say that there is a religion of inclusivism all around us, that the only thing that matters is your sincerity towards whoever or whatever you think is God, and that's good enough for your salvation. Friend, the Bible disagrees with that. It tells us that there is no name, not another name, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. And that's only through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are specific in what we do with the gospel. 
Specifically, every time someone walks into the doors of this church and they find themselves in a worship service, they need to know for certain that what makes us tick, the thing that drives our worship, the thing that changes our lives is a relationship with Christ and Christ alone. You are a witness of Jesus and declaring them, declaring him to a world that desperately needs him. See, it's easy. It's easy to get become so sidetracked. Yesterday, I was meeting with a group of pastors, and we were we we're meeting with a young guy or, or, or a younger guy and talking to him about the ministry of being a, being a pastor and, and, and sharing, and, 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 and the sermon calendar came up. We talked about, you know, what? how do you preach? What do you do? How do you, how do you find when you preach and, 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 or, or what you're going to preach and things like that? And, and somebody asked the question. They said, well, do you do all the holidays? And I said, no, I don't. I don't. Somebody says, well, how do you get away with that? I go, I don't know. Nobody's ever called me out on it. And, and, and here's my point. At times in the church, we've allowed every hallmark holiday in our culture to so lead us into what they think we need to be doing. I guess since it's Mother Day, let me stick my foot in my mouth, all right? You know what? Somebody says, what's your Mother's Day sermon about? I go, Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. They go, that's interesting. That's interesting. That doesn't, that doesn't mention mothers. <laughs> I go, you're right. It doesn't. It really doesn't. I, I go, but it's interesting. It's, it's going to be spoken to a room full of mothers. Absolutely is. And you know what? I'm not against that. I'm not against individuals that do that. And, and I believe that from time to time when the text calls us to talk about mothers, that we, that we do it. Or, or fathers, or, or Fourth of July, or uh, let's keep naming. What about a Labor Day sermon, a Memorial Day sermon? Do we, do we always go down these paths? When the text calls for you to do you do it. But make certain that the message of the gospel is never sacrificed by the calendar of the day. We have to be specific in, in, in our gospel message and declare the good news of Jesus everywhere so that everyone knows what our witness is really all about. I read a story a long, long time ago about a fish market. And it was interesting about how they tried to... Uh, they, they tried to change how they were branded on their sign and and so they they had this phrase on there that says fresh fish for sale today and i go well you know that's a whole lot for somebody to read when they're passing by why don't we why don't we take off the word today if we're open they know it's for sale today and so it would say fresh fish for sale well then they go you know the integrity of the owner is kind of on the line, and, and, and they would think if we're going to sell fish, hopefully we're going to sell it fresh, so let's take that word off so it's easier for people to read. So it just said fish for sale. And then they said, you know what, it's a fish shop and we're selling fish, and so I don't know why in the world we should have to tell them that, that we have fish for sale because they know when they walk in we're not just giving it away. So they took out the phrase for sale, and it just said fish. On the sign. The moral of the story is, is they closed their doors. Why? Because nobody knew what they were doing. Nobody knew what they were doing. You say, well, David, that's crazy. We would never do anything like that. Friends, I would say the church did that a long time ago. Many churches did that a long time ago to say, well, you know what? To talk about sin is offensive. Sh should we talk about heaven and hell? That's that, that's. Hell, hell, hell kind of offends people and, and, and there's a lot of things about heaven we don't know. Should we talk about that? Should we say that Jesus is the only way to salvation because that really sounds kind of narrow-minded? Should we declare the Bible to be the word of God because, you know, there's some questions that people have about that. And the church became less and less specific about what we're doing and why we're here. We believe Completely and totally what Jesus said is that we are to be a vocal specific gospel witness for the glory of God alone You shall be my witnesses 
Think about all the ways in which we can tell about the beauty of who Christ is and the difference that he has made in our lives. Talk about Jesus' compassion. Talk about how he, how he engaged individuals and how he loved the unlovely. How he called upon us and he said the greatest of commandments are that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you love your neighbor as yourself. And, and that these things are elevated above all the law and all of the prophets. And we declare that's what Jesus said and so that's what we are going to follow. That we are called to be vocal, specific witnesses of the gospel. Number three, think of this. You will be prepared and mobile with your empowered gospel witness. There is a geographic step that takes place next here. Jesus said as to where they were to go. Look at the last part of the verse. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's, it's interesting the distinctions that he made at this particular point. Let me show you a couple of maps here. If, if you're not familiar with the geography that's, that's in Palestine, uh, that the beige part on the bottom, that's, Ju that's Judea. And below that, you see the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where they were. That was their location at that particular time. Judea was their region. It was a, a culture that was like theirs. And then Samaria was above them, and they were non-Jewish people. And then he says to the ends of the earth, and, and certainly if we trace the book of Acts, Acts at, the, at this particular point, uh, that was going all the way to Rome for Paul as he um, took the gospel to the world. But think about this, to Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth as to where they were to take the gospel, that they were to be mobile with the good news going forward. There's another slide I want to show you uh, about how one individual kind of broke this down. This is actually pretty good. We think about our hometown. We think about our Jerusalem. We think about our Judea. It's our own culture, people that are they're like us. We're similar to them. Then, then Samaria is a nearby culture. This is non-Jewish, and so therefore it was going to be different. There was some racial hatred there, so it was going to be different. And then they're to take it to the ends of the earth, to places where Jesus is not known. We are to be mobile in declaring out the gospel of Jesus to the nations. I read this this last week. I want you to think about this scene here. There's a couple of words that are cut off of this, but it says this, two billion people today need someone from outside their own people group to bring them the gospel. Two billion people. To Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And there are two billion people that need someone to bring Jesus to them. Now, the commission is clear, right? It didn't say you can. It didn't say you should. It didn't say you, you might if you have time. It said you must. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit is upon you. And you will be my witnesses in all of these places, starting in the beginning and going to the ends of the world, to my Judea and to those that are like me and then to those that are not like me and to, to cultures across the globe, we take the good news of the gospel. These are the last words of Jesus. This is those words that are as important as don't forget to breathe. This is to the church to take the gospel to the world. Two billion people face an eternity outside, outside of a relationship with God. If we don't tell them the good news of the gospel. So, so today, what do we do with this? As we think about what the scriptural record says, we know we're to be vocal. We know that we're to be mobile. And we know where to go and tell. There, there are certainly different levels as to which we engage in this last one. That we are prepared and we're also mobile. Part of our preparation may be mobilizing others. It may very well be our prayer support, our financial support of sending the gospel to the world and others who are willing to go cross-culturally. But that does not relinquish our responsibility to constantly be witnesses. Drive around Bowling Green and the nations have come to us. It's, it's, it's amazing. Right here in the middle of our Jerusalem, the nations are here. And then we actively share the good news 
with them. On Wednesday nights, we pick up a large group of individuals from Cave Springs, and we bring them here to church. I was watching, and I shared this with the church a couple weeks ago. I was watching them get off of the van, and it was about 14 Burmese children, one by one. It looked like clowns coming out of a VW. One by one, they began to come out of there, and they knew where they were, and they run right down the sidewalk, and they run right to the playground. And my heart jumped inside. I said, Lord, I praise you that they are, they, they are familiar and they are comfortable with where they are. Now show them your spirit. Bring the nations together through the gospel witness of the church. We live this out. I want to show you four ways in which you can live this out just before we close today. Number one. Here's what I want you to do. This week, I want you to meditate on the Great Commission passages. At the end of Matthew, at the end of Mark, at the end of Luke, at the end of John, at the beginning of Acts, there are these four passages that declare to us what we must do and who we must be for the glory of the Lord. If you take a picture of these things, take a picture of them. If, uh, uh, if, if, if you do social networking, we will have those on the Facebook page and all those other things. If you don't do any of those things, I've got you a list right at the Welcome Center. You can pick that up today. And this week, Monday to Friday, meditate on these scriptures and what they mean to you and, and what they should mean to you and, and what it should call you to do differently next week than you did from last week. Uh, number two, I want you to think about this, is, is I want you to think about our VBS Care Night. Um, VBS is our largest, from a dollar standpoint, it's our largest investment into an evangelistic work in the city of Bowling Green that we do every year. Um, we, we have more volunteer hours. We have more time in the building this week than any other week of the year. And, and the Lord has blessed and brought many individuals to us, and, and we're signing people up online. But we do so for this reason, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with our community. This week's theme, or this, no, this week, this year's theme is in the wild. Over the next couple of weeks, and if you walk around, you're going to see this. The building is going to be a transformed into a jungle, and you're going to see a lot of things in the wild. You're going to see a lot of animals that are, aren't real, thank the Lord, but there are going to be pictures of them all along the walls. So next Sunday night, here's what we're going to do. Next Sunday night at 5 o'clock, we want to go into our communities we do this a lot of different ways in getting the word out, but sometimes a face-to-face -face conversation or just an invitation that we can give individuals by putting it in their paper slot in their mailbox or taking it to their door and leaving it there is, is a wonderful first step. Every year we do this, we have great conversations and great interactions with our neighbors. We want to be indispensable to our community. They build a house a day around the Calvary Baptist Church, and we are... We have an incredible stewardship to make certain that they know that we're what we are about. This is living out Acts 1-8. Um, between 2,000 and 2,500 homes, we want to hit next Sunday night. Now, if there's 20 of us, we won't accomplish that. But if there's 100 of us, we'll do it really easily. So here's what I'm calling upon as your pastor. Please be here next Sunday night at 5 o'clock. Take your phone out right now. Pop it in your calendar. I need to be at church at 5 o'clock on Sunday night. Can I bring my kids? Yes. Yes, you can bring your kids. As a matter of fact, your kids will be better at this than you will. All right? Bring your family. Make certain that we make this an event that as a church we do together. We, we don't have anything else on the campus that night. This is the only thing that we're doing, and we're going out into our community and I can guarantee if we have 100 people, it will take one hour, unless you stop and talk to somebody for 30 minutes, which, which if you do, that's a great thing. So we need 100 people next Sunday night. Put it on your calendar. Don't think I'm, not, don't think I'm talking to somebody else. If I can look you dead in the eye right now, I want to let you know that I am talking to you. You guys in the balcony, you're not out either, okay? So make certain next Sunday night, I need 100 people. I promise if you are terrified of talking to someone, I'm not going to make you do that. You can put a flyer in a paper mailbox, okay? All right, so that's next Sunday night. Number three, this last year we began taking up what was called the 24-7 missions offering. 
the Lord blessed in a tremendous way. We will begin to take that up at the 1st of November this year. And I challenge you, as we did last year, to plan as a family how you're going to invest in the gospel work. Um, 70% of this goes to the world. About 20% of that goes to North America. About 10% of it we keep in Warren County. All of it leaves Elrod Road, and we do gospel work with it. We're sending out 16 different individuals on short-term mission trips in the month of June. $300 a piece, we as a church are able to pay for their particular mission work because we have this offering from last year. And praise be the Lord for that. Prepare for that as to how the Lord would have you give in funding and working towards the gospel. Then the last thing is this, and something we've talked about for the last two weeks. Who's your one? If there's one individual that when you read Acts chapter number 1, verse number 8... You see their picture that they desperately need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Who are they? Who who is it? Who is your one? There's a couple of training sessions for for trainers that are tomorrow um, from 12 to 2.30. I'm going to be attending that one. Um, There's some others that are attending the 6 o'clock to 8.30. Here's what I need you to do if you're interested in going to that. It's at the Warren Association of Baptists. I'm going to be standing at the back door right after church today. Come up and say, hey, David, sign me up. It doesn't cost you anything. Lunch will be provided for you, and and we'll talk about how we train others and how we encourage others to find one person, one person that we can target with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the beauty of what would take place if 50% of all the churches in Warren County took seriously this call to find one person that needs Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Wouldn't it be great? to have a seeding problem because individuals come to know Jesus Christ because of your effective gospel witness. I would say this. Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8 says that's not optional. And it shouldn't be a hypothetical. It, it, It should be that you realize that you are called by God's glory. You are empowered by His Spirit. You are told a specific witness And you are given a location, and the location is everywhere to tell the good news. Would you pray with me, please? I'm going to ask you to stand everywhere, just with your head bowed and your eyes closed. At the end of the sermon, I've asked you to do a couple of things. I want you to pray about what what specific one you need to engage in. How can you help? Where can you serve? Because remember, these last words of Jesus, he didn't give his options. He says, you will be, you must be my witness. And, 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 and here's, here's, here's an important thing. It is so easy to turn away from these things. It is so easy to say, well, you know what, well, that's a preacher. That's what, that's what he does. That's what's important to him. Not really important to me. I know how easy that is. It's, it's the cares of this life. But friend, let me tell you, this is the call of the one that has saved you from darkness to light. It's the call of the one that loves you more than anyone. And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to take serious these words that were spoken to you, these last words, these most important words that were repeated over and over and over again about your responsibility for Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ as Savior. And as I talk about the gospel and think about um, all the things that we get to tell others about, you say, David, I don't know that I know that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I don't know that I have embraced him have a relationship with him in that way. Friend, I'd love to be able to answer any questions that you might have. I'd love to put you with somebody that can do that for you today. I'm going to ask you at this point to respond in the invitation to just come right to where I am. And there's somebody who would be ready and willing to talk to you about your relationship with Christ. Perhaps there's other things that you need, you, you need today. Maybe you need somebody to pray for you. Maybe we, want to, uh, maybe we want to pray for your family and pray for your mother. Husbands, pray for your wives and lift them up for the example that God has given them. 
to be for their family. Maybe a mother just wants somebody to pray for them. However the Lord's leading today, I encourage you to respond and ask God's hand to lead you and guide you in this most important work. Father, this is your invitation. This is your church. These are your people. Lord, we praise the Lord that it's your gospel that can change the lives of individuals. And Father, we pray that we would be radically changed by that today. In Jesus' name.